Okay, uh, so my name is Sarah Wade. I teach for the Game Art and Design Department. Um, I teach a varying, a varying assortment of classes. Uh, the ones that I'm teaching starting today will, would be C210 2D animation as well as uh, GAD 412 level design. So if any of you are in those two classes, I will be seeing you every day, most likely. Um, otherwise, uh, if I haven't had you in a class, um, I hope to at some point, or if I have, uh, welcome back. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, animation in Unity, getting your character animations into Unity, um, get how to set them up in game, how to set up your transitions, uh, all of that sort of stuff. We'll talk about the animator component versus the animation component. It can be a little bit confusing, um, but we'll we'll hopefully clear some of that up. Um, what we won't be talking about today is how to actually create that animation. I'm assuming that um, if you're if you're in this presentation, you have at least a little bit of a familiarity with Unity. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to be an expert by any means, but at least as, in terms of knowing how to, you know, navigate around the scene view versus the, you know, the project view and that sort of thing. Um, so basic Unity knowledge. If you don't, that's okay too. You can sit in and and I'm sure you'll hopefully learn something here, even if it's just your first introduction. Um, if it is, if this is your first introduction to Unity, I would recommend going back um, on the department, the GAD and MAA YouTube channel. I did a, a couple months back, I did an intro to Unity presentation. So that is available for you to take a look at if, if you need a little more background after this. And this presentation will also be recorded and put on that YouTube channel. Um, I will, let me, actually, let me just pull up a link to that so I can put that in the chat. And I cannot type. <laughs> I have not enough coffee today, apparently. So this is the URL for uh, basically anytime there's a faculty presentation, it will be added to this page, uh, usually within a couple days. And I will put into the chat that URL. So if you want to go back and refer to this presentation or any of the others, uh, that's where you would do it. Okay, uh, so yeah, so we won't be talking about how to actually animate today, but assuming you've got an animated character, uh, you're going to want to, you know, in order to put that into a game, you're going to want to get that character into Unity. So uh, the, before we actually, this is, this is a character just from the, um, I, I downloaded this from one of a digital tutor's tutorial, so, um, you know, I didn't create this character, it's... Um, it's just, it's a character with some animations just as a starting point because we're not going to be going over how to animate. So we need something to start with. Um, in terms of creating animation, you know, to, to put an animated character into Unity, you don't necessarily need to be an animator. Uh, one great thing about Unity, and I think part of the, the strength of, of Unity's, or one of the reasons Unity has such a, a market segment strength is because of the asset store. The asset store basically allows anyone to create and sell or give away for free assets. So um, if I, you know, I'm going into here, I can just, this is the asset store window. I can go into animation bipedal and I can see there are a whole bunch of free animations in here. I got, I've got raw mocap data from Unity for a biped. Um, you know, and you can click on one of these and read all about it. You can download these and you can usually, you know, you'll you'll want to check if there are any notes for that particular asset. For example, if you have to give credit if you use it in your game or if it's just a, you know, a royalty free kind of thing. Usually if you buy an asset, you can use it in your game uh, without any problems. So you can buy animation in the asset store. You can also buy character models in the asset store. And just to give you a sample here, Looking at the humanoid, you know, there are all these different categories, fantasy, human, sci-fi. Uh, let's just take a look at the humans. We've got uh, a soldier character pack that's free, a male, a female, multiple soldiers pack, zombie pack, you know, and, and 
like I said, anyone can submit to this asset store, so you'll usually have a really great uh, selection in terms of, you know, getting started with a game. Another thing you can do is if you, you know, you see this soldier and you say, oh, I'd really like a starting point, but I don't want my soldier to look like everyone else's. Well, you can, you know, you can download this soldier pack, and then you always have the option of taking that model and, and creating your own textures for it or altering the geometry. Um, just a quick note, if you do alter the geometry, you will probably have to uh, rebind and reskin the model to a skeleton, so that's just something to consider. Um, so that's that's uh, just a good sort of prologue to to get you excited actually about using Unity and that you can really just jump right in and get started. So we'll be using this asset for this demo from a, a digital tutors tutorial because I I know that it's set up with uh, animation that I'm happy with. And then we, if we have time, we'll be using a, a generic asset from that Unity character, uh, Unity asset store character from there to retarget animation. If we get that far, if we don't get that far today, uh, I will probably just create another presentation uh, on that in the future. So before you get into Unity, uh, it's a good idea to just sort of follow a few best practices um, before you export your animation to Unity. So Unity will accept animation directly from a lot of different applications. Um, the most common are Maya and Max. Uh, that's, you're likely learning one of those two at Art Institute or both. Um, those are the two that are used most widely in the industry. So Say you've got your character, you've got all your animations set up in Maya or Max. Um, this guy was built in Maya, uh, and that's what I tend to use. There are a couple things to ensure before you export that animation and that character. Uh, the first one is to sort of model efficiently. So, well, this is the imported guy. Let's see if we can get into the actual, let's see if I downloaded the actual <laughs> Maya file for this guy. Um, if not, Oh, there we go, Art Institute. Um, we might be able to just open this F FBX in Maya. Let's see if it'll let me do that. And then we can take a look at it in Maya so we can talk about a little bit of this uh, geometry stuff. Um, so basically, you want to make sure you model efficiently. And by efficiently, uh, you don't want to have more. Oh, and I'm marking this. You don't want to have more geometry than you need for for any particular thing for good deformations and and so on. Sorry, let me just get back to this guy. Unity raw assets. There we go. Okay, so we're going to look at this guy. Let's see if it'll open this file. Warning bind pose. Okay. Okay, so we can take a look at this guy. Um, okay, so efficient geometry. By efficient, uh, looking at this model, you know, we've got... You can see that we've got sufficient polys to allow for good deformation. You know, we've got a good series of, of five edge loops around the knee. I'd say the minimum you can go to with there is three. But basically, you know, looking at this around the knees, elbows, shoulders, uh, we've got only as much geometry as we need. We don't have excessive amounts of polys, but we've got, like I said, enough edge loops around those major joints to allow it to smoothly deform. So that's the first thing. Uh, you want to make sure you have no n-gons, which would be um, basically anything with more than four sides. You don't want to have that. Uh, you don't want to have any unnecessary polys or triangles. Um, when you rig your character, you'll want to make sure that you've tested that rig and tested that, um, you know, so you'll rig your character and then you'll bind the skin to the rig and then you'll uh, basically go through and adjust all of your skin weights. So once you've done that, you'll want to make sure that your character is uh, tested in some fairly, I, I like to test with extreme poses. So, you know, this pose is fairly normal. But you can see here that, the you know, with this pose test, the, 
the elbows bending fairly well. Um, you know, you want to make sure if you stretch the arms out, you don't have any tearing or any excessive folding in the mesh. So make sure that you test those motions after rigging. Uh, and then finally, when you get to your animations, you can, and let's see if we can even see the animations on this guy. If I imported the correct one. Yeah, this guy might not be the, I might have not opened the animated one because I don't see any keyframes. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we do have animations. So, okay, it looks like we've got an idle animation here. So when you're setting up your animations, you can take the same character and you can create a separate um, FBX file for each animation. So you could open one file, you could animate this idle pose. Uh, you can open another file and you can uh, create the running animation and so on and so forth. Or you can put them all together into one timeline. Uh, either way will work with Unity pretty well. I tend to do, uh, like the person who created this file, I tend to do um, all of the animations in, in one timeline. Uh, I just... It works better for me. I think it's easier to just import it once rather than importing a bunch of separate files. That said, you can do it either way. It's not a big deal. So you can see he's sort of going through, you know, all of these different animations, reload, death, idle, running, strafing, etc. So once you've got that all set up, then you um, you want to export. Um, let's see. Let's just look at these. Export. <sighs> export. Export all. We'll go to that. Oh, but one more thing before you export is you want to get rid of any extra sort of nodes. So looking over in the outliner here, I've basically got a group with only the game asset in it and probably a weapon. Uh, if you had any extra group nodes or any sort of extra geometry, you definitely want to clean that up before you export because you want to have something very clean to work with in Unity. So when you're exporting, um, export it as an FBX and you want to scroll down here and make sure that animation is is selected as well as bake animation and what that's going to do is going to that's going to take the animation on your mesh and it's going to bake it down to the bones so that when you bring it into unity it's all there um so let's see uh, remove control objects yeah so if you've got any control objects or any constraints especially you want to bake that animation down um, oh, another thing is to make sure when you export your character that they are in the T pose. It's a good idea to actually, let's see if this person did this. I like to have the first frame of my animation be the T pose. Oh, yeah, and this person did that as well. I usually make the first frame a T pose and then uh, start into, you know, the idle on frame one. Uh, which is exactly how this file is set up. So thank you, Digital Tutors, for that. Um, and yeah, so the T-Pose, the reason for that is when you bring your file into Unity, you will, the first thing you'll want to do, one of the first things, is to set it up um, with the, the bone structure in Unity. And if it's in the T-Pose, it's a lot easier to do that. You can still do that if your character's not in the T-Pose. It just becomes a little bit more complicated. And then one final thing before you export, uh, Maya uses a Y up, so that's not a big deal. If you're using Max, I think, uses a Z up configuration, you want to make sure that your character and rig are oriented with Y up uh, so that when you export, uh, you know, your character is facing the right direction in, in uh, the exported FBX and then in Unity when you import it. So we're going to close out Maya. We don't need that anymore. And I think this file is actually already set up, so I'm going to go to a, I think I'm going to start a new project. And we'll just call this demo, and we'll let it sit right there. Okay, so, why is Unity asking me that all of a sudden? Oh, yes, so <laughs> I have not updated to the latest Unity yet. Um, if you're working on a game, generally, this is just an aside, um, if you're working on a game and Unity comes out with an update, uh, you definitely want to check with your old team and make sure that 
it's cool with everyone if, and that you're all going to update because uh, sometimes the updates can cause problems. And if you're working on a, a big project or a, a project with a large group, uh, you definitely want to allow sufficient time to adjust for that. So I am in mid of another project. That is why I have not upgraded because as a team, we've decided to finish the project before um, any of us upgrade. So, okay, so let's do... Actually, so, okay, I'm in Unity. I don't even have a scene set up yet, uh, just the default scene. The first thing I want to do is I want to, you know, I've got this character. I've animated in my, animated him in Maya, or actually Digital Tutors has animated him in Maya. I am going to go ahead and import a new asset. Uh, let's see, Water Institute. Unity demo, I'm just finding where I put this guy. So let's, okay, so there he is. There's that FBX file. Um, that was already exported for me, but we, we did go over how to do that. So I'm just going to import that. And I'll see in my assets, I've got this FBX biker. And you can see over here on the right in the inspector window, if I have that biker selected, I can hit play and he should loop through all of those animations. So I can see that my, my animations came in okay. Uh, might be a little less smooth, a little, a little, it might not be deforming just exactly as it was in Maya. Um, that, that we'll take a look at that in a second and see how our, our guy is set up. So. Let's just pause that. Okay, so I've imported this guy. I just need this go to meeting window. I don't know if you guys probably can't see that window. And feel free to type in the chat at any point if you have a question or something comes up and, and you just need a little more explanation or you don't quite understand it or I'm not explaining it well enough. Uh, feel free to pop into the chat and let me know. Um, like I said, everyone is muted, so you'll have to chat type into the chat if you want me to <laughs> see your question or comment. Uh, so, okay, imported. The first thing I want to do is I want to go to this model section. Uh, when I import something, uh, you know, your Maya files, despite, you know, there being some standards of scale and whatnot, you know, Maya files, Max files, different characters in the same software created by different animators or different modelers, they might all be at the same scale. So, as an example, let's pull this guy in, and I just drag, drag in this guy to the scene file. He's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, so the first thing I want to do then probably before I take him into the scene file is I'm going to go, again, in my assets, select this biker guy, and in the model tab, there's a scale factor. I just, he's 0 0.01, I think that's pretty small, so I'm going to change that to 1 and hit apply. Generally, when you make changes to a model, rig, anything, you're going to have to hit apply, and if you try to navigate away from this window, just to demonstrate that, if I try to change this back to 0.5 and then go to the rig tab, it's asking me, wait a minute, you changed something, don't you want to apply that change? Uh, I'm going to revert because I, I actually want it to stay at at one. I don't know why it didn't revert that for me, but theoretically that's what it should do. Um, so now that he, now he's at a much more normal scale in the scene view. Um, just to backtrack a second, one other thing uh, to think about is when you, before you export it from Maya or Max, also you want to make sure that your character is standing on the 0, 0, 0 point or the origin. Um, that's why he's now standing on the floor. If he wasn't set up to, well, he's close to the floor anyway. If he wasn't set up on the origin, uh, that might not have worked out quite so nicely. Is he standing on the floor? Oh, yeah, it looks like he is. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, yeah, so that's one other thing. Okay, so I've got my character in here. I have got the scale set properly. The preview looks good. The next thing I'm going to do is go to the rig section. Um, in Unity, you may you may have noticed there there are different animation systems. There is Mechanem, which is sort of the 
the newest animation system in Unity, and I think probably the most flexible and the most, um, I, I don't want to say efficient. It's, it's, a, it's efficient in terms of your time and setting up your transitions and such. Uh, there's also the legacy system, and so on this rig tab, you'll see that I have the animation type, I can choose legacy, which um, we'll actually test that for something else. Um, legacy works, again, it, it can be an older rigged character. It can also be, you know, I would recommend using legacy for like prop animation or if you have a character that is animated but not animated to a rig system. So, you know, maybe it's just um, like I have a, a teddy bear where it's just separate pieces of geometry for the arms and the legs, and that's the way it's animated. It's just, it's not rigged, it's just I've moved, you know, key set keys rotating the arms and legs and the, the whole hierarchy. So if you have something like that, you'll definitely want to use legacy. Um, generic and humanoid will both work with the mechanism system. Uh, the difference is that humanoid can, if you use the humanoid rig type, it will allow you to retarget animations from one character to another. Uh, that can be really useful. For example, if you've got a game and you've got four possible avatars or even more for the player character to choose from, you know, you can set up one of those characters. For, so let's say this biker, let's say we have a female biker as well, and maybe we have a zombie biker, and maybe we have a, a police officer, and they're all different models, but if we are, in, if we import them all and we use this humanoid rig type for all of them, we'll be able to set up the animations for one, uh, for the biker, for example, and then retarget those animations to the female biker, the zombie, and the police officer. And that, as you can imagine, saves a lot of time because you won't, you can basically animate once, use everywhere. And going back to that um, asset store, as we saw those animations, you know, the mocap animations, uh, raw mocap data, or animations from an animation library like Mixamo or animations that are created by someone else on your team, you can basically take those animations and target them to all of your rigs. So again, a huge time saver being able to do that. So we've got our biker, we've got his rig set to humanoid, and now it's telling me, uh, you know, asking me what I want to do with the avatar. Do I want to copy it from another or create from this model? I want to create from this model. This is the first time I'm setting up for this project, so I'm just going to leave that selected, and I'm going to hit configure. Uh, it's asking me to save my file. Sure, always a good idea. Since I haven't named my scene yet, I'll just call this scene one. Um, let's hit apply. Okay, so now uh, you can see guys popped up here and you can see all those bones inside of them. Um, everything is green here. That's good. Uh, if anything shows up red in here, that means that you've basically got a bone that's not in the T-pose. So if you had exported your character in, you know, say the first pose of the idle animation, everything in here would be red and you would have to manually go through and adjust. Um, you could try uh, you can try down here enforcing the T-pose, um, and that that can work pretty well, uh, but that will occasionally, you know, that might cause some of your bones to rotate a little bit funny, so you might have some bones um, popping out of the rig where they weren't before. So I would recommend just having your character in T-pose. It looks like, oh, that's the bone for the weapon. Okay, I was going to say it looks like we've got a funky bone, but that would be the weapon. Um, okay, so looking at this guy, a few more things I've got to do to set up this this rig. I've got, you know, some bones that aren't aren't attaching here. It looks like, you know, his lower his lower leg isn't really, you know, how's that going to look if we've got the upper leg animated in the ankle? That might cause a little bit of a disconnect there or a little bit of a, a hitchiness in our animation. So I'm going to go into this left lower leg. And it's pretty common in a production rig to use a double knee bone. And that's what this rig, it looks like that's what this rig does. So I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to say, 
I want to use knee B instead of knee A as the lower leg bone. And then you'll see that lights up. So that's going to be, I think, a better way to set this up. So basically what, what I'm doing here is telling Unity, uh, you know, Unity has this, this default sort of rig configuration. They've got, you know, all of these green circles are required bones that your rig has to have to be matched up to Unity. Uh, these these dashed ones are sort of bones that you can use with Unity if your rig has them, uh, but they're op optional, so you don't have to. You don't have to have a rig with a chest bone. Often your rig will have more bones, and so that's what we're doing here. You've got to just go through and assign. Let's get this project window out of the way. And again, I'm going to just pick knee B. Get that guy. And it looks like the arms have the same problem, double elbow rig which is great for deformation, actually. And even though I'm only assigning elbow B, for example, uh, the rig will still use elbow A for deformation. So I'll still get the benefits of that double elbow joint and that double knee joint. I'm just not having Unity target animations to uh, or control the animations with that joint, if that makes sense. So, so you get the benefits, but you don't. Unity just doesn't need all that extra info uh, in order to set up the base rig. Okay, so I've done that for the elbows. Um, and then finally, this is pretty common too. I almost always have to reset the chest bone. Uh, usually my spine rigs, like this rig, uh, have more bones than than Unity does. So you basically got to just pick, you know, I, I, I want this one because that's the chest bone and you're going to have to skip one of these, you know, one, we're only basically able to use um, so many bones in the spine. So I'm just going to go with, I'm going to go with that upper one for the chest and this guy will be skipped. I don't think that'll matter too much because I've got you know, I've got sufficiency around the waist here, uh, and the mesh will just deform between. And like I said, it will still use this to deform. It's just not something Unity is using to target those, those animations. So I've got my rig set up. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to hit Apply. That's going to apply those changes. And then I'm going to hit Done. And... Okay, this guy. Okay, so rig is set up. That's fantastic. Now we can go to the animations. And let's get this window up a little bit more. I'm trying to keep i uh, I've got this little window for the meeting tool that has the chat in case you guys type any questions, guys or girls. And uh, it's, it tends to get in the way. Okay, so my animation's looking good there. But as you can see, they're all together. I've just got... Um, in this animations window, I've basically got sections for import animation, which of course we, we've done. We definitely want that. Uh, but I've got, uh, in this clips list, I've got one giant clip. Uh, it's frame 0 to frame 262. And as we saw in our Maya file, we actually, you know, we had a lot of animation in there. Idle, run, strafe, and, and so on. Um, so let's look and see if there is a list in here. Typically, in a production workflow, your animator will give you a list of, you know, if the file is all put together into one, your animator should give you a list of what animations are in there and what frame numbers they are. So, sorry, I'm just trying to remember where I put the... the Oh, that's right, where the raw files were. So let's see if there's a list in here. I hope there is. Otherwise, we're just going to have to wing it. Well, let's see if we've got another one here. Digital tutors. No, don't think I have it there. So, all right, we're going to have to just wing it uh, because I closed the Maya file already. So let's just... I think let's do we'll keep our clip one with everything but I'm just gonna I just hit this plus button that's gonna add a new clip and I'm gonna call that clip idle and just hit enter so that it, it assigns that name I'm gonna have the idle start on frame one and you see down here he's popped into frame one so uh, because I neglected to find a list, uh, it, it's possible there's a list and I just didn't download it. 
I do that kind of thing all the time, actually. Uh, let's just see if that idol goes to frame 20. And we'll play and see how that works. So that's a little jumpy if you see how it's not looping quite properly. So let's try, let's try frame 60. Oh, see? Okay, so that turned red. There's no loop match there. So basically Unity is looking at the, the frame. It's looking at the first frame and it's looking at whatever I type in as the, as the end frame. And it's, it's sort of analyzing that animation and saying, can I loop to here? Can I you know, can I do this? And and it, at frame 60, we're in mid-run, and at frame 1, you know, obviously that those poses are different enough that Unity's saying, you know what, I can't, I can't loop from this pose to this other pose. So let's try 50. Oh, and it looks like maybe we, maybe we hit the nail on the head right there. We've got a smooth, this guy's pretty small down here, let's make him bigger. Um, yeah, we've got a pretty smooth loop, so it looks like the animator made this idle animation about 50 frames, and that's going to work perfect. So we've got our idle animation, and we just are going to keep going through here. Actually, it's 10.35. I want to make sure we have some time to get to some other things, so let's just set up one more. Um, you're going to want, well, before we set up another, uh, See, the idle's still, so that's going to, yeah, so we will set up another first. So I'm going to go ahead and put another one in, and I'm going to call this one run. Um, let's call it run forward. Okay, so we've got run forward. We know the idle goes to 50, so let's start the run forward on 51. And that looks like it's still an idle pose. Let's try 52. Oh, maybe we can start on 51. Let's go 51, and let's try 100. No, nope, no loop match there. Let's see. This is where that list would come in handy. So let's see, it runs about 16 frames. We'll try a, can I loop there? Looks like we're getting into the backward run. So let's try frame, let's see, 51, 61, 71, 62, 62. 75. I'm just guessing, again, because I don't have that list. I typically do a run. Um, that's not quite right. Let's try 72. That's not quite right either. Oh, 71's getting closer. And we've still got some popping there, but and that could be because of our start frame as well. So I'm just going to try one more adjustment. Okay, we've got some popping, but that's pretty close. But okay, so now that we've got this run animation in here, you'll see that the, the sort of the ground is moving a little bit down there. And uh, one of the things that you can choose, you know, with all, you've got all of these sort of options for your animation. Uh, you can choose if you want it to loop. Of course I do. Um, loop pose, um, cycle offset, that's basically if you have a little bit of a hitch, which we do in this one, you'll want to offset that a frame or two to sort of make it loop more smoothly. Um, but then finally, you have this root transform stuff. So do we want to bake it into the pose? Do we want to use the body or orientation or the original? Um, I think Okay, so the, basically what, what this comes down to is if you use, when you set up your animator component, you can tell it to use the root transform or you can tell it to not use the root transform. So if this character in the Maya file is actually running across the ground, then its root is transforming. And if I tell Unity to use its root transform, when the character runs, uh, it will move across the, across the screen. So... If you, if you want to, you know, use your animation basically to control the character position, that's what you would do. You would use that root transform. 
if your character animation is running in a cycle and you want to use Unity or your code in Unity to control the position of the character, then you would not use that root transform. Uh, so that's that's going to be the difference there. Uh, somebody just to welcome to who, whoever just arrived. Um, let's see. And then basically you can say, okay, so that's the root transform rotation, the root position in the Y direction. Of course, we want to we want to keep that Y original and see that that basically kept him from bouncing up and down. And then the XZ, uh, we will use original rather than center of mass. And that's going to basically tell it to use the original with the animation. And that's going to that smooth that out a little bit again. I probably didn't pick the exact right starting and ending frame, so that might be a little hitchy. Um, let's check out our idle again and just make sure we've got a nice loop there. Looks like we've got looks like we've got a nice smooth loop. So, okay, I'm not going to take the time to go through and set up all of these other animations that are in this clip. Um, we will just take we're, take get rid of that and we'll. We've got an idle and a run forward, and that's enough to go over the mechanism controls, so we will stick with that. Okay, so I've got my biker. I've got my biker. Oops, let's make sure we apply that. Thank you, Unity. Okay, so now I've selected, instead of selecting my biker in the assets, uh, I'm not no longer selecting the mesh. I'm going to select the guy who I, the biker instance that I've dropped into my scene. And here is where I can start to set up the mechanism controls. And basically, mechanism will uh, let you set up a state machine that'll tell you know tell your character how to animate. So if your game tells your character that it is in an idle state, uh, the state machine will will set that up. So you see, I've got this animator component. Unity has an animator component as well as an animation component. So that can be a little bit confusing, but basically, Animator is what you use with Mechanem. Um, it's it's the newer sort of iteration. If you were using a legacy animation like we talked about earlier, or a prop animation, or an animation of a character that doesn't have an actual bone rig, then you would use the animation component. Um, they both can be controlled via code. The difference basically is that you cannot use the mechanism system with the animation component. You need the animator. So we've got animator, which is exactly what we need for this guy. Um, but you'll see that I have when I look at the controller, it's it's got nothing. There's no controller set up. So to set that controller up, I'm going to go back to this guy in the assets, and I'm going to do create. Animation controller, I'm just going to call this biker controller. And then I'm going to go back to this guy in the project view. And with him selected, I'm going to drag that biker controller right over the controller there. And now you'll see in my animator window right here, it's popped up this any state. Um, there are no parameters set, but basically now I've got a controller and in this animator window I can set up all of this stuff, all of the my state machines. So uh, if this window doesn't pop up or you didn't already have it set up, it may be that your game view is visible and you need to click on animator. You can also go to window um, animation and that'll show this. So actually it should be called animator. Oh, animator, there it is. <laughs> so, okay. So, got that, and now I want to set up my states. So, let's just get this guy out of the way. Um, basically, I'm just going to drag that idle in there. You want to drag whatever your default is in first. I think that's the easiest way to go about it. But if you don't, you know, you can also, you can also select, you know, you can also set that up later. So, I've got my idle animation. It's orange. That means it's the default. I'm going to also drag in my run forward animation. Okay, so I've got two animations and now I basically need for, I need to tell Unity how to transition between them and what to transition between. So let's do make transition from idle to run forward and let's make another one from run forward to back to idle. Uh, because that's what, you know, my character is going to be standing still and then he, you know, the player hits the, the forward arrow or whatever control you've got set up and you need some way to tell Unity to transition. So when I click on this arrow, 
that brings up this transition window. Um, actually, let's, let's do something different before that. Let's set some parameters. So um, before I tell Unity how to set up that transition, I want to tell it what under what circumstances should Unity transition from idle to run forward. So for run forward, I want a parameter, and I'll, I'll make that a float, and I will call it speed. So if the speed is, let's say, 1, I want, I want Unity to run forward. Um, usually you'll see more parameters. We didn't set up our jump animation, um, but you can say, you know, is... Oh, did I set that as a float? No, I set that as a Boolean. So yeah, you you can set a Boolean, and I usually call it is jumping. And uh, I'll leave that as false for now, the default of it being false. Um, I want my default speed to be zero, but I want Unity to know now that if my speed is one or greater, or greater than zero even, that I want it to transition. So let's see here. So we've got run forward, da, 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 da. we've got idle, okay, okay, and so now in here, uh, wait, let's make sure I've got run forward selected, sorry, I'm a little bit scatterbrained at the moment, okay, so I've got run forward selected, and I basically want to tell Unity what, uh, under what conditions for run forward, whoops, there we go, yeah, so if speed is greater than zero, and is jumping is false, then I want Unity to transition from idle to run. And you'll see that blue arrow is highlighted. That's because that's the transition I'm working on. So I'm so again, if speed is greater than zero and is jumping is false, then Unity will basically transition from idle to run. And if we look in that lower right hand window, we can see that's happening pretty smoothly. Um, Unity usually sets up a pretty good default. If you don't like it, you can actually go in here and you can drag this, uh, you know, you can drag this to see how you want it to overlap. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that transition, so I'm not going to do much adjustment to that. Again, our run animation, we didn't quite set that up perfectly, so that might be a little bit janky, but uh, then I'm going to go back to my other transition, and I'm going to say, okay, to transition from run forward back to idle, I want, again, I want is jumping to be false, and I want speed to be less than, let's say, 0.1. Uh, so, or you can do 0.5, and again, you need to decide this sort of based on your game and your gameplay and, you know, how fast your character can go. If your character is going to have a run speed of 10, then you might say if that speed gets to less than 1, I, I want to go back to idle and just have the character stop. Um, you know, this guy's speed is 1, so I'll just say 0 0.1, and, and that should work fine. And then again, I can I can see down here that he's 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 not completely popping into that idle pose he's he's sort of smoothly sliding into it and that's gonna that's gonna work for me for now so that's the basics of how you set up a state machine and again if we had set up more animations if we had set up our strafe our run backwards all of that stuff then that would show up here and we could just drag them into here and that of course will all apply to uh, any, t any instance of the biker in the scene view. That can be controlled with your C-sharp script or JavaScript, whichever you choose to use. Um, uh, you, can also, um, you can also just control it with um, using the drag and drop stuff in Unity, but we won't get into that. Um, so that's the basics of Mechanim. As you can see, it's pretty flexible. Uh, it does a pretty, a pretty awesome job, I think, with the default, uh, default transitions. Again, just uh, another thing you can do really quick before we get out of Mechanim is, well, let's go back in here. 
you can also set up masks. So if I have, for example, an animation clip that is a reload, uh, my character is going to need to reload in the idle position. He might want, you know, we might also want to have him be able to reload while running. So you can set up a mask in here that will use only the legs, or in the case of a, whoops, a reload, we want to use we want the reload animation to be the upper body. So basically, uh, that animation clip will only control the upper body and the legs will still be controlled by the other clip, whether it be the idle or the run. So that's a, another great, um, great super flexible part of Mechanim. And as you can see down here, because we've, we've set this mask, you know, we've, we've messed up our idle animation, but um, we're going to undo that, so that's okay. But yeah, we've basically set a mask so that only the upper body is being controlled. So let's just undo that. And now we see he's popping back, so his whole body is, is animating. Oh, and then we've got, there's that root motion example. So this root motion is controlled by body orientation. Let's pop that back to original. Bake into pose, bake into pose, and then our idle should be right back to normal, not bouncing and rotating all over the place. Okay, so if anybody has any questions about Mechanim, um, really quickly, type that into the chat, and I'm going to move on to another method of animating using the anime, animation controller rather than the animator. So let's get out of this window, back to our game. We've got our Steam view. Oh, yes, apply. Thank you. I love that Unity reminds me of that. I wish that Unity would remind me. Uh, for example, if I'm in the game view and I start making changes, I wish Unity would remind me, hey, you're in, you're in playtest mode. You're, none of your changes will save, but it doesn't, sadly. Um, okay, so we're going to delete this biker guy from the scene file, and I'm going to pull up an animation example that requires that old legacy component, which uh, you might think, you know, legacy, it's not as good. Um, I, that's not necessarily the case. It's just, it's not as targeted at rigged animation like Mechanim and the uh, newer system is. Oh, hey, Rocky. Um, Mechanism is already part of Unity. It's part of actually even the free Unity. So, uh, yeah, that's totally included. I'm not sure I, it's it's versions ago that it became part of it. So, yeah, you can use that for for example for everything you guys are working on in the IGDA game. You can use uh, and I think Jeanette is using Mechanism for the Teddy animations. You can use those for quadrupeds as well. You can use that system for everything, and it. It works pretty well. So yeah, definitely included, and um, as is this legacy that we'll go over next. And I'm running a little bit. That's okay. You missed the very beginning. You don't have to be an animator. You can actually download a lot of animation stuff from the asset store. And if you do go, this will be on the YouTube channel. If you go back and watch it, um, we talk a little bit about that at the beginning. Uh, so you don't have to be an animator to use animation in Unity. And for that matter, you don't have to be a modeler either. You can you can get a lot of stuff out of the asset store. Uh, so yeah, assets. Let's let's import a new asset, and I believe that before this presentation, I think I set, oh, raw assets, there we go. So I created this FBX file, and I mentioned this earlier. This is just a teddy bear that's a quick and dirty teddy bear. He's he's not even one mesh. His arms are, his arms are separate pieces of geometry from his legs. Um, he's animated just by anima animating the rotation of those joints. So there's no rig. There's nothing that we can assign to a mechanism system. There's nothing that we can assign to um, one of these animation types. So let's just say here, let's drag this guy in. Again, you want to adjust the scale first. He's super tiny. So let's go back to our Teddy run and let's make him bigger. There we go. Now we can see this little guy, which is fantastic. Okay, so again, he, he doesn't have a bone system. Um, there's nothing, again, nothing to sort of attach there. So if we go into that model, we've set the scale. So in the rig here, I'm going to choose Legacy. 
uh, that's going to allow me to sort of still have that animation without having to set it up in a in a, in a mechanism system or with a bone system because he doesn't have one and I sure don't want to build one for him. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, if we play here, we can see that, you know, he's, he's animating. He's just down and dirty animating <laughs> even though he's got no bones. Uh, and that, that is the strength of that uh, legacy system. Uh, the other thing you could use that for is, is like a prop or something. You know, if you have, say, something like a spinning jewel, uh, you could animate that in Maya, import it into Unity, use the legacy control to have that spinning jewel reward just twirling all the time wherever it is. Or maybe you've got little sort of idle characters that just bounce around in the forest up and down in the same spot, you know, you could use this for that. Um, you can also code that sort of animation for props, but oftentimes it's it's easier just to have, you know, your animator. The more complex the prop, the more complex the animation. Uh, so to get this guy animating in the scene, let's see if I hit play. Oh, he did animate one time. That's fantastic. So you'll see now that with this Teddy guy, I've got animation, not animator. And it's it's a little bit less of a complex component, but again, it gives you that flexibility to animate anything. It doesn't have to be a biped. You can also animate quadrupeds with uh, Mechanum, I believe. Um, but, you know, it doesn't even have to be a character. It can be anything. It doesn't have to have bones or rigs or any of that stuff. So very flexible. Um, but you've got a few options in here. I've got, I've got an animation array of size 1, which is perfect because I've only got one animation for this guy. He's just doing his funny little run. Um, I could set this to 10 if I had 10 animations, and I could set as many, you know, as many clips as I wanted. And then I can target them with code by using animation.play, and I can play them by name. So I could call this one run. I could have an idle, a jump, same, same as all that stuff you use in Mechanim, but you don't have your transitions built in. So with this system, if you were animating a biped or any sort of a character, you have to build your own transitions um, or code your own transitions, blend them that way. So it doesn't have that automatic blending, but it does have it does have some cool stuff. So we've got always animate. And let's go back into our teddy guy here and let's add a loop frame. And let's see now if he's looping in the oh, he's still not looping over here. But that's okay. Clips take a one, frame one to 18. Oh, there we go. Loop. So now that I've set, okay, so I've set that on the actual mesh component or the imported component. Um, I've set it to loop. And now that will automatically apply to the guy, you know, Teddy instance that's in the scene view. So now if I hit play. I've got this guy playing over and over again. I didn't loop it quite smoothly, but you can see in the game view, I, I don't even have lights or a floor, but you can see that basically he's animating, and that was that was a little bit quicker than setting up the mechanism system. So that that's the basics. Um, we are just about out of time, but I will stay a little bit extra in case anyone has any questions about this. Um, this is a lot to go over sort of in one whack. Um, but that, that's the basics. So we've covered um, exporting your animation from Maya. Uh, that happens the same, by the way, if you, whether you're exporting something with a rig um, for use with Mechanim or something with a rig or without a rig for use with that legacy system, you still have all the same concerns before you export from Maya. Um, and you still want to always bake that animation. If you're baking animation that doesn't have a bone from Maya or Max, uh, it will just it will bake it to the mesh, so that's still a, still something you need to do. Uh, we went over importing, um, and once we import, we you know the first thing we do is again we go to that model tab on the imported uh, object and uh, set that scale. That scale is really important. There are some other things here. Um, you know you can tell it whether you want to import blend shapes, optimize uh, stuff like that. It gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, optimizing, you 
it's really important, especially for mobile games, which are really popular in this day and age. So a lot of flexibility there. We went over setting up your rig, uh, both legacy, and then we went over the basic differences between generic and humanoid. Humanoid mostly being uh, retargetable. And then once that's done, we went over how to set up your how to set up and split up your animations. That process is basically the same whether you're doing that for Mechanim or for Legacy. Um, you're still going to add those clips in the same way, set those frames. You'll have not as many options for this Legacy if we go back to this biker guy. I don't want to apply that. If we go back to this biker guy again, we see that each clip has a lot more options with the uh, humanoid rig type, you know, it's got all of this stuff, masking and, and curves and, and events in motion. None of that's really available with the legacy because it's a, it's just a more straightforward, uh, less robust, let's say, a less robust animation system. Uh, and so we went over that. And then once you get your animation set up, we went over how to set up the, uh, really quickly, how to set up that state machine and how to set up your transitions. Uh, with your variables, again, for speed. Um, let's see if, let's get this biker back in the scene. And, oops, FBX biker animator, biker controller, there we go. And so, you know, you should be able to, no, I must have drugged the wrong biker in, but you should be able to basically set your default speed and no, that didn't, he didn't animate, so I must have forgot to set him to animate by default. But you can basically test things out in your state machine that way by setting the default of your variables. You always want to, though, before you publish your game, set these back to, you know, you want your speed to start at zero, unless your character starts out running right off the bat. Um, is jumping, I'll leave it set to false. But like I said, you might have a bunch of these. You might have a forward speed, a backward speed, a side speed, you know, a left speed, a right speed for strafing, a reload boolean for... Uh, true or false if the character's reloading. Um, but you would all set that, you would set that all up the same way and you would transition from idle to strafe or idle to strafe left or idle to run backwards or uh, you can transition from any state to jump and, and this, you know, you basically set up, drag each animation in and set up those transitions again by clicking on that arrow and going over um, each each aspect of that. So lots of flexibility there. Um, so hopefully that's a pretty, pretty good recap. Um, we didn't get to quite everything I wanted to cover because we're out of time, but if there's interest, just shoot me an email and I can, I'd be happy to put together another, uh, like a part two presentation where we can go over retargeting animations from one rig to another. Um, again, like I said, that's a great time saver. That's my email in the chat window. And I don't see any I don't see any questions typed in but again this will be available on the YouTube channel um, I will save this recording today and uh, I will send it to the person in charge of putting that on the YouTube channel and as soon as they have time for it uh, they will put it up there so look for that in a, I would say in a couple days maybe even today if they're really not very busy um, so that's all I've got Oh, export strategy the same for Max as it is for Maya. Rocky, yes, um, pretty much the things to make sure before you export, you want to make sure you have efficient geometry. That's the same uh, for both. There's one particularity with Max. Max uses a Z up system. So before you export, you want to make sure that your model is set up to use Y up so um, or is oriented so that Y is the up direction. That way, when it comes into Unity, you won't have to, you know, rotate it. You won't get any funky behavior. So that's the one specific thing to max. Otherwise, everything is pretty much the same. Uh, you want to make sure your character's at the origin. You want to make sure any extraneous stuff, uh, extra group nodes, extra uh, stuff that you don't want in Unity is deleted from the file. And then you want to make sure that you're exporting to FBX and baking your animation. So... Yeah, other than that uh, Z up changing to Y up in Max, it is exactly the same. Um, you know, the, the export windows are a little bit different, but the, the options are pretty much the same. They're just arranged a little bit differently. Um, so, yeah, any other questions?
You guys are used to it. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually hard to talk for an hour straight. It does make my throat a little scratchy. Yeah, and, and everyone, feel free to email me if questions come up after this. Um, I put my email in the chat. Uh, you can certainly email me there, and hopefully uh, my email will end up on the YouTube channel with this video, too. So if you're watching this after the fact, um, you can email me with any questions. Okay, so that's all I've got. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to attend this presentation. I hope you found it informative. Uh, if you have suggestions for future presentations that you'd like to see, again, feel free to email those to me. Um, I put these together every now and then, and I'm always looking for suggestions. So that's all I've got for now. Um, everybody have a fantastic day, and I hope to see you next time.